Learning about a tragedy that actually turned into our triumph. We want you to know that our stories don't define us. That's right. Yeah. They're just part of our journey. And so we'd like to thank you for being here and ask that you give us just a few minutes of your time. We know that human trafficking is not just sexual exploitation. Human trafficking is the exploitation of human beings by others for the profit. And so each one of us will tell you about the different phases of human trafficking because human trafficking has so many different phases. Not every story is the same. Not every pain is the same. My name is Pastor Donna Hubbard, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I was a special little girl who came from a special little girl, and a grandmother who taught me how to pray. And I always knew that I would do something special with my life, but I wasn't sure what that was or how, I was gonna, how it was going to happen. I started off, married off at a very young age, to a man who was much older than I am. And when I realized that was not going to be my lot in life, I left with three children in tow at the age of 20, looking for love in all the wrong places. And I found a chance to work a wonderful job as a flight attendant. And I met this guy, he was wonderful. He made a lot of money, he was a celebrity, he treated me like a queen, he took me to parties. We were drinking champagne, y'all, in the penthouse. Until one day I woke up, that, that night at that party, he took me to, I woke up and there was another man on top of me and it wasn't him. And there were other men standing along the wall waiting their turn. I don't know how long it lasted because I passed out. Mm. And when I woke up, I was alone there. I got dressed and I left. I was too ashamed, too afraid, too confused. I never heard from him again. I did not know what I had done. I tried to anesthetize my pain with alcohol and drugs. I didn't know the men who had raped me that night, but they knew who I was. And I would be at a nightclub and they would lean over and whisper things in my ear that they had done to me. When I couldn't take it any longer, I left and I ran to California. I took my children and those my three children, we moved into the worst neighborhood I could possibly move into, but I thought I was free until I learned that everywhere I was, everywhere I went, there I was, and so were my memories. I moved in down the street from a man and his wife and, and her sister, and they helped me with my children, and they helped me find a, a, a job, and they would watch the children, and they would give me food, and he was a pimp. And after a while, he told me I now owed him. And that I would do what I was told to do or I would be beaten. And I was. I was beaten and left for dead three times. Being afraid of what they were going to do to my children, I figured out how to get up and get home. And after he could no longer control me, he sold me to a gang and I became gang property. I was sold and traded for Super Bowl tickets and weapons and drugs and, 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 and at, the, at their very whim. And they told me, you will do what you're told to do and you will bring that money home or else one of your daughters will. And I would have done anything to protect my children. And I knew the less that they knew, the safer they were. This went on for seven years. I left California and moved to Minneapolis where they found me. And at that point, my daughters were much older. So I did what I was told, knowing the only way I was ever going to get out was to go to prison. I went to prison, and while I was in prison, I was sentenced to 12 years, two times, 24 years in federal maximum security prison. But it was there I learned how to be free. I had left my children with my mother because they didn't know where my mother was. At least I thought they didn't. And two weeks after I had been incarcerated, I called home, and my mother said, "Your friends brought us a microwave." Mm. I said, "What friends?" She said, "You know the guys that always visited you." I learned how to keep my mouth shut because I learned that's where, that they knew where my mother was. But what I want you to know is I learned in prison how to be free. My children and my, my mother 
took care of my children. I told a counselor who was willing to listen, a correctional officer that was willing to listen, my story, and the men were arrested and prosecuted. I came out of prison standing flat-footed. I am no longer a victim. I want you to know I am a survivor. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and I'm not Come on, baby. Today, I am a very proud flight attendant for American Airlines, and because of my story, I have a different perception and a different set of eyes in the skies. I want you to know how important it is for you to not only open your eyes and see what's going on around you, but to do something about it. Our stories are not the same. I want you to hear another story. Alicia. My name is Alicia Kostkevich, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When I look back at my childhood, I remember it being such a happy one. I had when I look back, I can remember that it was really the start of the internet entering the home. And I spent a lot of time online because that's where my friends were. I was also a shy child. And online, I felt that I could express myself. And I felt safe. This was my home. Nothing and no one has ever hurt me here, and nothing and no one ever can. Now this was back in 2002, and there was no internet safety education. There were no stories like mine. There was nothing for my parents to tell me about. There was nothing to go on. There I was online, and I was in a chat room, and I met somebody who I thought was a boy around my own age. What I didn't know is that he immediately began to prove me. And grooming is so easy. It's a term you hear a lot these days. But grooming is just pretending to be a child's friend. Telling them what they want to hear versus what they need to hear. And it's hard to be a kid. Kids don't feel pretty enough, smart enough, handsome enough, fit enough, this enough, that enough. And a predator's goal is to make them feel like they are enough. My parents loved me. I was enough and more. Sometimes that isn't enough. And that's a scary thing. He groomed me for about eight or nine months. On New Year's Day 2002, I went outside to meet this person who I thought was my friend. I walked out of my front door. I didn't wear my coat, and I left the door open because I was planning on coming right back through it. I was going outside to say hello to a friend. Now it was icy, it was cold, and this was something that was so completely out of my character. Looking back, that child was me, yet she wasn't. I stood there for a moment and this little boy spoke up. My intuition said, Alicia, turn around and go home. This is dangerous. And next thing I knew, I was in the car and this man was squeezing my hand so tightly that I thought it was broken. He was barking commands at me. Be good, be quiet, my trunk's cleaned out for you. He drove me from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Virginia. I remember the sound of the car stopping, and him dragging me inside his house and pulling me down a flight of stairs. Opened this room, threw me inside, picked me up like I weighed nothing. Mind you, this room is absolutely pitch black. Props me on this table, and he says, It's okay, it's going to be really hard for you. I don't mind if you cry. Then he turned on the light. And on the walls were all these torture devices. Oh my. This was, as has been accurately termed by the media, a basement dungeon. After that, he put a lock and dog collar around my neck, and he raped me for the first time. Over those next days, I was raped and beaten and tortured. People often ask me, did you think you were going to die? I knew he was going to kill me. And my goal was to stay alive long enough to be found or to escape, no matter what that meant, no matter what it meant, no matter how humiliating or disgusting or painful. I felt that as soon as I was of him, this is a horrible word, of no use to him, he was going to kill me. 
On the last day, which I didn't know was the last day, he said, I'm beginning to like you too much. Tonight we're going to go for a ride. And I knew that that was the day he was going to kill me. But thankfully, that was the day that law enforcement literally busted into the house, cut the chain from around my neck, and set me free, and gave me a second chance of life. Yes. My rescue was an absolute miracle. While he had me, he had live streamed what he was doing to me, to other people online. And somebody saw this. They saw my missing poster, and they came forward. Talk about a miracle. I'm so lucky. And people say that all the time, and I say it. I'm so lucky. After a period of healing, at the age of 14, I realized that this was going to continue to happen when I started to go into schools and teach kids about internet safety. Because I knew that this was going to happen again and again and again, and it has. I spent the last 16 years of my life talking to whoever in a room that I could talk to about my story, about internet safety education, and about keeping your children safe. The internet is an amazing tool, but it is also so dangerous. I have been able to take this horrible, awful, disgusting thing that happened to me and give it a purpose. And I know, I know in my heart that I have changed people's lives. The song, Rise Up, was playing when we came out. And what that means is that you have to come from something lower, something awful, something terrifying. And we, we are able to reach into the horror and pull other people out. In fact, we call it by name. Recently, I had to rise up once again. I'm strong, I'm brave, I'm this, I'm that, I'm over it, I'm good. Absolutely not. My capture was released early, and he is living next to my parents, basically. He is about four miles away from my parents' home. 